This episode is brought to you by Beyond Pride. When you advertise with First Nations, make sure you advertise with Pride. That's www.beyondpride.com. Pride spelled P-R-Y-D-E dot com. All right, guys, we're back. And uh, like we said, we have a special edition of the Creators Game podcast. Uh, We have another guest. We have Delby Paulus. How are you feeling today? Oh, not too bad. Getting old, fat, lazy. Other than that, not too bad. Looking great. (laughs) Oh, thank you. So tell us... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> I want to get to the very, very beginning. When was the very first time that you picked up a lacrosse stick? Because now you are making lacrosse sticks. When I was uh, probably about five, uh, I started messing around with lacrosse sticks. Uh, my brothers uh, wouldn't let me use theirs. I was too young. But I would grab them every now and again. When probably closer to three when I was taking her stick when they didn't know it. But uh, I started playing when I was six. Uh, that's when we had the uh, lacrosse team down here, and we played out of the box down at Seneca Longhouse. And that's where I met guys like uh, Kenny Hill, uh, Mike Bombery, uh, Rod Bombery, all of them, the guys that played Benny Thomas, Mike Thomas, guys like that. And that's when we were six years old. We all start playing together. So, like, uh, back then, um, was there even leagues? Or was it just like, like you said, at the Longhouse? You just, that was your, that was your boys. That was your friends. There was a league. Uh, it just kind of started out. Uh, we never had our own arena. That's why we practiced at Seneca Longhouse. Albert Smoke was our, was my first coach. Uh, Eugene General, Howard, Howard General, his dad, they were all, they were helping Eugene was playing. He was our goalie. But, uh, yeah, we would have to, if we wanted to play in the arena, uh, we had to go to either Waterford or Hagersville, uh, Caledonia, the surrounding area, because we n- never had our own arena here till what, 1974? Something like that, yeah. Yeah. So the first bunch of years that I played, that's what we were kind of bouncing all over. We never really had a home arena but, uh, yeah, we may do with what we could do. And sometimes when the time was taken up, we'd have to go over there even with hockey at 6 in the morning at these arenas or be late at night. That's the only time that we were able to get. So we took whatever we could get back then. Then when our arena came along, that that made a real big difference. Uh, there's so many guys, you know, made so many friendships over playing together uh before there used to be always uh kind of teams what they called down below and upper enders and stuff and there was always this rivalry but when the arena was built i think that helped uh to get rid of that stigma of upper ender down below because we all played together we played hockey together we played lacrosse together we played baseball together you know we made a made a lot of friends just uh, through playing lacrosse and sports. And uh, by the arena, are you referring to the, the Gaylord Paulus Arena? Yeah, the Gaylord Paulus Arena. That was the original arena here. Um, but, you know, now we have the, the ILA uh, that Kurt and I built. And I remember when uh, we were building it, and Kurt and I were sitting up in where, where now where the... Uh, banquet hall is but there was no glass we were on the cement floor up the top there the core slab they were doing the floor getting it ready to pour the concrete for the floor and Kurt and I were sitting there on the chair and that's what we said I'd like to see 10 years from now five years from now 10 years from now how many more championships we will have in years to come how many guys are we going to have playing in the NLL? Because at the time, I think we had maybe seven or eight playing in the NLL. Mm-hmm. And now I, I wouldn't even be able to tell you how many guys have played in the NLL and how many guys have excelled in the NLL that came through our arena. Well, you, go ahead. You look at the banners. We have so many banners up in the arena there. When they take the videos on the TV and stuff, you look and you see all the banners. And, you know, stuff like that, that's the kind of stuff we were hoping for. And it turned out that with our guys being able to play 
all year round. You know, their stick skills, their conditioning have gotten so much better. Years ago, we couldn't get into our arena to play lacrosse until after, like, April, they would take the ice out after the skating carnival. All these other teams, they got so many arenas, and they're, they're got their guys out there practicing late February, March, April. Mm -hmm. So it took us half the season to get caught up, and then come playoff time, we were right there with them. So now, with us having the arena and being able to play all year round, we're almost ahead of them. And, and we look at all the championships, I feel that we are the capital of lacrosse. Yeah, we're definitely like the mecca of lacrosse. And when you when you look at like uh, you said like all those banners up there, does uh, any one banner stand out to you, or like uh, one championship being like, oh, I just that that year that year was the one. Well, when we uh, built the arena, it was we had the sod tur turning 2003 on Father's Day. We had the first game in there, 2004, on Father's Day, and that's when uh, the arrows. Uh, they had uh, gotten skunked uh, the year before, so they asked um, Randy Chrysler, myself, Jason Johnson, if we would coach the Arrows. So, and they they had said in the meeting when they fir we first talked, they said, uh, "Well, I know this is going to be a building year, so you know we're going to work work away, see what we can do to better it." And that's I said, "Whoa, whoa, whoa." I said, if you're using this for a building year, then you don't need me here. Because if I'm going to be here, I want to win. I want to win the championship. And it kind of surprised some of the the uh, management that I, I would say that. And I, I said it because I meant it. And that year, 2004, we did win the Ontarios. Mm -hmm. So that... That banner up there to me, you know, it makes me feel good. That's kind of a special one for me, the Ontario. We end up uh, in the Minto Cup out west, but due to injuries like Cody Jamison, he got hurt and he wasn't able to play in the finals. And we had a few other injuries and stuff. We, we end up, we didn't win the Minto Cup, but we were right there. Yeah, I, I remember that because I was one of those kids who actually like was like watching it in 2004. And I remember um, you guys all met up at the uh, the Speedway when you when you came back. Was that the year? Oh, uh, I can't even remember. Um, no. It was at this at the Speedway after like um, you guys had just had won the Mental Cup or were going to the Mental Cup or something. Oh, and I, and I like I believe that was the year because like um, me and Warren used to always kind of talk about it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that year we didn't win it. Uh, we end up getting beat out of, out in uh, BC, but the next year, that's when I think when they ended up when it was it 2005 or six they, they ended up winning. I I didn't uh, coach the next year because um, you know being a coach, you want your players there all the time. That's you know don't miss practice, don't miss games, be there all the time and. You know, for me, I was I was coaching the arrows, and I made sure I was there all the time. And my sons were playing in the playoffs; they were still playing senior. So my sons are playing in a one of their championship games out in uh, Peterborough or, or Brampton or somewhere. And here I'm at an arrows lacrosse practice because I, we've grounded into their heads to don't miss. You know, so. For me to miss and go to that game, you know, it was hard because my heart was one place and my body was another. My heart was out there, but I had to be at Arrows practice. So that's when I made the decision that, you know, I didn't want to coach next year. I, I love watching my kids play, my, my boys and grandkids, and that's, that's my life, you know, mm -hmm. watching them play. I'm done. <laughs> Well, that's what it's. I read not. It's been about five years ago that um, per capita, Six Nations puts out the most pro athletes, and that's just strictly lacrosse. Um, so 
kudos to you guys putting that building up because you guys have put us on the map, not only literally, figuratively, um, per capita, we put out the most pro athletes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Kurt's got a lot to do with that for sure. Oh, yeah. Like, Kurt, yeah. he's you got to give him all the pats on the backs that you can because, you know, without Kurt, you know, I was part partners with him, but... Uh, without Kurt, you know, we wouldn't, uh, lacrosse wouldn't be where it is today uh, mm-hmm. on the reserve here. Mm-hmm. He, uh, not just here, but like what he's doing in the NLL with yeah. Halifax, with yeah. what he did with Rochester, those kind of things. Yeah. You know, you got to give credit where credit is due. And, you know, I think Kurt, his heart is in lacrosse, and I think that's... That's one of the best things that ever happened down here. Uh, in Rochester, he he literally turned that franchise oh, overnight. Yeah. Literally, he he turned them into champions. Yeah, and uh, moving them to Halifax, like the Halifax fans are, they're insane. Yeah, they love the team. They like. I haven't been to a game out there, but I'm told that like, it's it's quite the place. The place is rocking when they're playing at home. I've games. only I've only seen like pictures and stuff, but like that arena looks beautiful and mm-hmm. it looks huge and all the fans, the energy, it looks it looks crazy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so for me, that's what I say. I like to give credit where credit is due, and and I think Kurt has done so much for lacrosse down here. Um, I know uh, I had uh, uh, Tom Suckamore and. Uh, Jack Hill and Buck Smith come to the arena when we were building it, and uh, I, they wanted to nominate me for that uh, Hall of Fame, and I, I said I didn't feel like I was worthy of going into the Hall of Fame because I didn't win nothing. I came second so many times, like come second in the scoring, come second in the our team. You know, we never never won the, the actual championship any of the teams that I was on. So I didn't feel worthy of going into Hall of Fame. They said, well, what about as a builder because of the arena and stuff? I said, I would go in there if Kurt goes in with me. But other than that, I said, no, I never, I wouldn't go in. The, I didn't, I don't feel like I deserve to be in the Hall of Fame. So, so I never... Never uh, looked into it anymore, and I know they told me go to Brantford, go to the library. They'll have all your clippings and stuff like that of when you played and stuff. I said, if I deserve to be in the Hall of Fame, I think they would have all of that stuff. So for me, I didn't feel that I I should be in the Hall of Fame. You are pretty legendary, man. Like, I just got to tell you, you are pretty legendary. Coming from someone like, you know, a totally different generation, like, I can tell you that there are there are still even a younger generation than me to look up to look up to you and be like, oh, like, this is, this, like people still be like, this is the Delby Dome. <laughs> oh, I got in trouble over that. <laughs> when, uh, when George Beaver put that article in the paper and he called it the Delby Dome, and I, oh, man, this, and then... I had a, a late lady come to me. Why are they calling it Del- Delby? I, said, I, I can't control what George puts in his papers and stuff, <laughs> you know. But uh, I, I said we can call it Kurt's Castle. That'd be fine with me. I don't, <laughs> don't, don't matter. But like for me, the Iroquois Lacrosse Arena, it's for the people. You know, there's other things that we could have probably done with our our money and stuff rather than build a lacrosse arena, but that's where my heart was. You know, I'd rather build a, have the arena and help, you know, the community because it was so hard with just the Gaylord Paulus arena uh, available to us. You know, we'd have to go to Hagersville, uh, Waterford, Simcoe, Caledonia, you know, looking for a floor time. So that's why I wanted to, to build the arena when we first started, we, uh, well, actually, my wife and I went out to Oakville to watch the first girls' box team. And uh, Charlie Wayne's uh, daughter, Carrie, was playing on her. So we went out there and watched. And it was a snowstorm that night. And there was about 350 people went out there. And they had to pay $480 for two hours to play out there. 
So that's on the way home. I said to my wife, I said, we need a lacrosse arena. I said, look at all the people come out here to watch uh, in a snowstorm. I says, we need a lacrosse arena. I said, heck, I should build one. She said, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. <isn't> it? <laughs> and usually you kind of think she's, I was thinking she was going to say, yeah, right, sure, kind of thing. But, uh, you know, she told me go ahead. So that's what got me started. And then I ended up partnering up with Kurt, and that made the process go so much quicker than what it probably would have if I would have tried to do it on my own. Yeah, and like in uh, the ILA does bring so much talent here. Like, of course, it is a hub. It is like we're, we're in the mecca of lacrosse here on Six Nations, but and it's a hub for a lot of talent. But it also brings a lot of talent here from other places. Like, for example, this young man here, he come here from Japan to learn lacrosse. So, like, um, what? Um, who are who are some of like the legendary people who have actually like stepped foot in the ILA? You know, I I think about. Um, the question that who's the best lacrosse player you ever played against and the first one comes to mind for me Jeff Gill mm -hmm. he's from Cattaraugus Oak Newtown there hands down he's best player I ever played against another one uh, boss bucktooth Freeman bucktooth those guys were awesome like they're they play both ways they're team leaders uh, we had a lot of good players down here. You know, I could go through a list. Of, I could start off with uh, Tim Squires, uh, Jim Squires, Bill Squires, Boss Squires, uh, Roy. Um, I could go Daryl Squires. He's one of the better ones that I ever played with was Daryl. Uh, look at George Atkins, uh, Kenny Hill, Dan Logan, you know, guys like that, defensive guys, Mike Bomberry. Um, Con Smith, Kim Smith, uh, Jay's relatives down the line there. Mm -hmm. uh, Scott, he was a good lacrosse player. We played on the Warriors together, and all solid players. Kevin Hanhock, probably one of the hardest shots around. Brian Martin, you know, I, I think back. Evan Thomas, you know, Evan, he, that guy, when he was young, and he was probably one of the best around for years. You know, Evan, you know, to look at him nowadays, you know, he looks kind of funny. But it's probably him calling me yeah, right now. He, <laughs> it, um, Evan, I consider Evan a friend of mine, and I, I, I had the honor and privilege of in, inducting him into the Hall of Fame. When he, when, he was, when, when he got the call to go in, and I said to him, Evan, you've played, you've played with so many great players and you have so many, so many teammates and friends that are that are still here. Why did you choose me? And uh, the answer he gave me, it I didn't see it. I didn't see it. Um, I've I've put in a I put in a number of years into this game. Um, I remember coaching the winter league program at the ILA for the first ten years that the arena was open. Mm -hmm. But what Evan said to me, and it, to this day, it, it chokes me up, because I, I, like yourself, you like watching your kids. Sometimes you end up coaching them. That's that's what gets you involved. And uh, he told me because I, I see that you have the love for the sport, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean we had a blast. Oh, uh, uh, <laughs> here I thought you were gonna say you're one of Evan's kids. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <that is. laughs> I thought, no, not him <laughs> too. <laughs> that too. <yeah. laughs> no, Evan's a good guy. I, oh, I know. I know how close uh, that Delby and, and Evan are, and mm -hmm. I see them commenting back and forth on social media, and I sit back and just laugh. I can only imagine <laughs> what it's like to be to be on a car ride with you guys. Oh, we go moose hunting every year, and that's I look forward to that. There's uh, roughly seventy days, but more exactly seventy days till we go moose hunting again. And Evan and I have been moose hunting for years, mm -hmm. and he rides with me up there. And, and it stays, we take uh, my trailer, and Josh and Bob and Evan and Preston and I stay in the trailer. And, you know, we just laugh the whole time. All the guys, like uh, guys that we hunt with, Ryan and Shog and uh, Gussie, guys from uh, a couple other reserves that go up there with us. We have a gay old time. We all love moose hunting. And that time to get away, that's kind of what I miss about not playing lacrosse is that 
uh, friendship and, and sitting around teasing each other mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. That's the part that I missed. Not only that, it's, I used to play because I could shower because when we were young, we didn't have running water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good reason to go there, right? Yeah, it's like, so, yeah, there's a, a shower of, there right after? Yeah, a lot of us, we didn't have, we were, we weren't rich. We didn't have money. Our families didn't have money. So to go to the arena and be able to shower, that was a, a bonus. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I had people on my lacrosse team like doing that too. Just being like, it'd be their moms telling them, you like, you better get in there and shower because there ain't nothing at home for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why you guys got afraid to shower when I was going there. I'm not, I'm not sure. What, I think Gaylord started that. <laughs> wouldn't want to get into that <laughs> it's say, another podcast I say, do we do we really want to know <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's another podcast uh so like on uh, seeing that like you're right in front of the ila and like you've known like you know so many people in lacrosse who's someone who stops by who uh just like will just like just talks lacrosse and that you'll get into it with and like what do you guys talk about like i feel like uh. that would be a, a good conversation like you know like kind of how we just had there you're talking about like back in the day and in Gaylord and stuff like that. Yeah, Evan. You know, Evan, him and I sit and shoot the breeze for hours. You know, Evan Thomas with, like, his brother Jeff, his dad Seymour, he coached us, uh, when, coached me when I was younger. And, you know, just to think about guys like that and talk about guys like that. Um, you know, Brian Martin, he was he was one, one of the best uh, shots that I ever played lacrosse with uh, he, I could play on the crease and he'd pick the goalie apart and then the goalie keep moving out so then he'd start giving it to me on a crease I'd just shoot an empty net um, you know to had, I, a, had a whole thing going on there eh? oh yeah George Atkins that was like a wand he had in his hand you know and, yeah, George there could be four guys fighting in the corner for the ball and George would go up there and snap it out and come out with the ball you know, and then when you got guys on your team like that and and uh, able to do things with their stick that nobody else could do, it it's makes you that much better too. And, and try to try to be up into their their cal caliber. I was thinking today about some of the guys that I wish could have kept on playing. You know, I, I think one of the guys that probably would have been a superstar would probably be Steve Bombery. Uh, he ended up passing away when he was young. Mike Thomas, there was a guy who was a wizard with his stick, just like his dad was. I never got to got to play with Ivan, and that was more Evan got to play with them them guys. Um, but you know, I I got to play with Gaylord and uh, old timers, and even playing old timers, he he still had it. You know, it was it made it fun to see and. I know a big part of my game was a backhand. Uh, I uh, pass backhand, I shoot backhand. When I was about 12 years old, I was over at Uncle Ross's and Gaylord was out there shooting at a board and I had holes in there. Here, uh, he put eight out of 10 in on the backhand from way outside. It wasn't right close. It was from way outside. Like he knew where it was going. He showed me, he said, get your elbow up. You know, when you're throwing, you got your elbow up. When you're doing it behind your back, same thing. And you can, you get more accurate. Like I, I see a lot of guys today, you know, kind of going like this and stuff. But, you know, and, and ever since that day over at Uncle Ross's, when, when he showed me that, I worked on it, I worked on it all the time, throwing it against the glass, throwing it against the boards, you know, stuff like that. Trying to do things that I thought that others wouldn't be able to do. And one of the guys that showed me something just playing in the yard, George Bombery down at Joe Johnson's. We used to play down there, Joe and Dip, Junker, a bunch of us. We all used to gather down there and play lacrosse. And we'd, yeah, we'd have dirt all the way up our pant legs, all, <laughs> you know, just out there doing things with our sticks and trying things because it didn't matter if it didn't work. Mm -hmm. If it didn't work, don't use it in the game. But then some things that George Bombery showed me he faked a backhand and then he backhanded it low. And I kept trying it, kept trying it. Finally, when I went to play in the, in the organized, I was doing it and, and I was scoring. So, 
you know, that was a big part of my game was uh, the backhand. Yeah, that's what uh, Koichi was talking about, how, that, like, um, he was saying that, like, it's kind of like the difference between playing with, um, you know, like, um, like in, in Japan, I guess, like, the, the, the caliber of all playing and, like, the IQ, sport IQ, lacrosse IQ, and then, um, of course, the stick handling was just that they didn't know, really know about, like, behind the back and stuff like that. I remember when uh, in the Worlds, uh, it was in London, the summer games and stuff, and... Uh, Team Canada was playing against Japan. And Steve Toll at the time was one of the fastest guys. He got a breakaway, nobody was catching him. When he got a breakaway, and he was probably 20 feet ahead of them guys, and there was two guys on the Japan team that caught up to him, everybody's like, whoa. <laughs> I said, you can't, can't imagine what these guys are going to be like when they get their six skills down, because at that time, that was back in probably... 2000 or so was it because i know yeah. Del delby was midget at the time so yeah it was back around in there i, I guess it'd be back in the 90s 95 maybe 96 I have to look it up koichi's nodding he probably knows yeah 95 yeah we uh yeah watched them out there in japan they they really impressed me with their conditioning and stuff and as I said, years to come, they're going to be a force to be reckoned with because they start to get their stick skills and start working on plays and stuff, which, you know, they had some, but they didn't have the caliber like Canada or U.S. or Iroquois Nationals, but Japan was right there with Australia and stuff, so I knew it was coming. <laughs> yeah, especially uh, the work ethic. Oh, like uh, I feel like uh, if you can just if you can just use like lacrosse like we've been saying this, this episode use lacrosse like the work ethic and everything that you learn like on the bench and on the floor and actually use it in life like they'll just co like coexist with each other and they'll it'll actually like work good so like if you think of like uh, Japan like um, I know that you train all the time like you go on this guy's Instagram this guy like don't you have your own like uh, pop up lacrosse net or something? Oh uh, yeah, like <laughs> Ko Koichi has showed up to to the arena for, for warm-up before the games. We usually have an hour and a half, two hours before each game for warm-up. Koichi's out there with his inflatable goalie shooting on the net by himself. He brings an inflatable goalie with him. Yeah, three hours before. Patches. <laughs> <laughs> That's another story. Evan, Evan That's Thomas Evan's can story. tell you about yeah. that. That's <laughs> Evan's story. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, with that but, away from him. But yeah, with that kind of drive of like you know bringing something like that three hours before before the game, if like every player like that was in Japan, they'd be oh. like a force to be reckoned with. Oh yeah, you know that was something. I I like to think that when we were young, we were we were good players. We had good stick skills, but we didn't have the conditioning nowhere near what the guys have today. You know, mm -hmm. I, and then Japan, for instance, you know, teams like that. That's where we had a hard time because, like, floor time was one thing, uh, doing things on your own. And I, I remember Uncle Ross telling me he used to run from one telephone pole to the next hard as he could down the road, and then he'd jog to the next one, and then hard as he could to the, to the next pole, and then jog to the next one. And he says, that's what you're doing on the floor. Some of these guys that are running five miles a night, they're just pounding away on their joints. They're not, and then come game time, they got to do a sprint and they're done. Mm -hmm. You know, so conditioning uh, for us, that's where I would, I started to do that when I was, I think I was probably about 14, 15 when Uncle Ross told me about that. So that's when I started doing, and it helped, sure helped my game a lot as far as conditioning. Who would you say are some of the players like right now? Like, because, uh, of course, like you know, the arrows are playing tonight. So let's talk about the arrows. Like, who are some of the players on the arrows that, uh, you know, that you, you're excited to see play? Uh, one of the ones that uh, Rory Smith, or uh, actually Rory's boy, um, Kalen. You know, he he plays on uh, junior B's, but when he comes up, I love watching that guy play. Like he's the captain for uh, what's that? Uh, Wallaceburg. Wallaceburg. Yeah, but to watch him. You know, he's he's awesome. You know, a lot of the Arrows guys that that uh, are playing on there now, I I don't know them by name. I know them by their numbers and stuff, and I know who can do what. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but as far as uh, 
I got to ask them, who's your grandparents? <laughs> I, yeah. I can't ask them, well, who's your parents? A lot of them I don't even know their parents because I'm an old timer. But, uh, yeah, the, the conditioning and, and guys that they have out there now, it's unbelievable. Have you ever um, seen, like, a player on the floor and then being like, who's his, who's his grandparents or who's his parents? And then being like, oh, it makes sense. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that Paulus, uh, I remember watching even Johnny and yeah. then his brother. Yeah. You know, watch him. Who's her pa? And then they, they say Joe. Uh, Joe Paulus, he was another one when we played. He was yeah. always, you know, he's a very talented player. He was always in shape, and he was a team leader. You know, he, he played on – I played lacrosse on teams with him in minor, and I, then we got into senior and stuff, and Joe was always a, one of the top players in, in the league. You know, we a lot of times we didn't play on the same team. Sometimes he played on a Caledonia, I played on the Wolves or the Warriors and stuff. But you know, it seemed like we all kind of got split up to where the it got uh, the talent got split up and filtered, watered down kind of thing. Whereas if we could have just all stayed together and got one good team, I, I think we probably would have had a lot of championships. Mm -hmm. But that didn't happen, so. That's history. Del was referring to Marshall. I, I was gonna oh. say that. <laughs> and uh, when you said that, like um, how, like um, you know, his dad was like a leader because like if we're talking about uh, Mar it would be Marshall's dad, right? Yeah. yeah. I said the same thing to Marshall because I noticed that when he was helping out with like the Grand River Warriors, I was just like, you know, he's young. However, when he go when he steps on that floor, everyone looks at him like, hey, he's a leader. Like it didn't. It doesn't matter how old he was, or it didn't even. It didn't even matter that he was like an NLL player. Like we, everybody knew that like he is an NLL player and he is good. But it was the mentality of like, nope, we're we're here to do work. Yeah. Like, let's go, boys. Let's go. Come on, man. Yeah. Like let's let, let, let's uh, let's let's actually put our best foot forward. And that's like that's what a lot of teams need. Is they need leaders in this whole community. That's what we need is leaders in this community. And that was one of the things, even with when we were coaching the arrows. You know, we had uh, uh, Stu Montour was our, our captain. And that's a, he said, guys, you know, 20 nights. We got 20 games, 20 nights you stay in. You don't go out boozing or nothing. Be ready for the games. Um, we had practice on Sunday mornings uh, to see who was going to give us 100%. And uh, a lot of the guys, you know, don't, I, we didn't discriminate from anybody if you weren't ready to play you didn't play that night uh if we had practice at 10 o'clock you're on the floor ready to go at 10 o'clock you're not pulling in the laneway you're not walking in the dressing room you're on the floor at 10 o'clock ready to go because we're going to be doing the drills and stuff some guys tested us and they ended up sitting out uh randy and jason and i we all we stuck together and that's what we didn't care who it was you know, it, that discipline had to be there. We're here. Why can't you guys be here? And like they say, that's 20 nights. Mm -hmm. You know, you got 20 games, that's 20 nights. You stay in, you give 100% to the team. See, I never had that problem because I was always on time for practice because, like, my stepdad was kind of like, he was he was like the coach. <laughs> so he would always have me there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Shout out to uh, Neil Hanock. He, he was kind of like a stepdad <laughs> to me. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, like... He, uh, he basically taught me what I know about lacrosse. Yeah, oh. And, uh, yeah, I would always be on time, though. But, th but like, that's, that's a part of the discipline of the sport. Mm -hmm. And I feel like if we got back to stuff like that, like how you said, 20 days, no going out, be at practice, be, be prepared, be here, be present. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel that, like, uh, if a whole team took that mentality and actually, like, kept that going – as like, as like that brotherhood of like, no, no, come on, man. Like, I know you want to go. All the boys are all bugging you or whatever. But no, no, we got practice tomorrow. No, no, we got a game. Or no, no, yeah. we, remember we said 20 days. Like, yeah. that's brotherhood. That's yeah. that's something strong that like can, again, what you learn on the bench and on, on the floor, you can use it real life. And that will just get players to a better uh, life in general. Just like, you know, just staying on the, the red road and different things like that. Yeah. There's. There's times uh, when you when you're coaching, and you look at your players, and you can tell which ones are doing things on their own. Uh, you know, guys are coming to practice and working hard at practice, but 
the days that we're not at practice, you can tell the guys that are out running on their own, that are going to the gym, working out on their own, and it makes it, the game seem easy to them. When you see them, you know, running with no effort and just working on their the plays and thinking about that rather than huffing and puffing and trying to get to a certain area to that they're supposed to be at, whereas, you know, other guys, are, it's almost like they're floating out there. Yeah, and it can even be like uh, I remember I was hearing it's like, oh, would you would you just pick up your stick today, or like, oh, did you forget how to pass, you forget how to catch, oh. things like that. And it's probably because you're not practicing outside. You're you're not you're not actually like playing lacrosse outside of this arena. You know, yeah. you, like pick up your stick once in a while, <laughs> throw it at the wall, play catch. What did you forget? Like, right? I don't. Ko Koichi, how often do you throw? Are you playing wall ball? Like every single day, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. he is. He's, oh, yeah. he's in the gym every day. His stick yeah. doesn't leave his hand. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, one of the things that Uncle Ross taught me, um, you know, when you're not playing, like your stick means everything to us. And when I'm done playing, I would stuff my stick with newspaper. He said that helps hold the pocket. And then the dampness will go to the newspaper rather than go get into your leather. And it seems like the stick lasts a lot longer when you take care of it. I've I've gone to guys' houses and their sticks been and equipment been out on the porch all night. I think, oh man, there's no way I would ever leave my stick outside like that. You know, and you see kids leaving them laying in the yard, you know, three or four sticks laying there back when we were young. We we're lucky to have one, mm -hmm. and when you got that one stick, you took care of it. That's why my brothers, as I say, when I was young, I wasn't allowed to take their <laughs> sticks, but yeah. when I was probably three, four, <clears throat> that's when I was grabbing it, and and then when I got older, and then I went down to, Dad took me down to Mel Squires mm -hmm. and uh, got my one of my first sticks, or it was my first stick uh, from Mel. You know, I, I always... I liked Mel's sticks. I I, I uh, got pretty close with their family, and uh, when uh, I was playing one game and one time, and here I had went to a tournament and I bought two Patterson sticks uh, for my boys, and I it, they were good sticks. And here uh, I broke one during the game, so I grabbed my other sons. So. Here I broke that too. I broke two sticks in one game, and Mel said, "I'll make you one you won't break." <laughs> and he made it, and I had a big handle, almost pretty close to this on the on the end, but it was narrower down here. And I would sit there with a glass and shave it down, get it nice and round and stuff. And I took care of that stick, and Kay would net it for me every year. Mm -hmm. Kay would net them, and uh, here after a while, like Mel, they wouldn't charge me. To, for my sticks and stuff and so here when Kay passed away that's a Mel asked me if I'd be a Paul Bear Bill and so I said it'd be an honor so I was a Paul Bear and that's a Mel told me that uh, well George and I George Atkins we were Paul Bears and he said uh, we were Kay's favorites so yeah it was an honor to to be a Paul Bear for you know, for for Kay, she was such a sweet lady. You know, it's you don't you don't uh, see them like that much anymore. Mm -hmm. Especially, she, you know, took care of us as lacrosse players, mm -hmm. bringing us sandwiches on the bus and stuff <laughs> like that. Yeah. yeah. You know, I never got to play with Jim. Uh, I was talking with Ev, Evan Thomas, and uh, that's a he said probably one of the best players he ever seen was Jim. I seen Jim play. But I never got a chance to play with him. I was too young. Evan got the chance to play with him. Uh, another one he said was Claude Salt was a, mm -hmm. had one of the hardest shots around. Me, I think Brian Martin and Kevin Henhog had the hardest shots that that I ever played on a team with. We had a lot of other guys had good shots, and you know, I I, I sit and think about the guys that we used to play with and and uh, how how good they were in their department. You know, there was guys that, Dan Dan Logan, you know, I look at him and you you gotta have guys like that. him and Ob, you know, Kenny Hill. Uh, Kenny was one of the, 
biggest and meanest defenseman you, <laughs> yeah. you'd ever want to run into. And Kenny played football and stuff too, so he loved to hit. Um, Con Smith, you know, Con, he, he was... He was like an animal out there when you piss him <laughs> off. Yeah. Nicest guy in the world, but you put that equipment on him, him and Dan Dan and Mike Bomberry, that's they turn into the Tasmanian devils. <laughs> Is that uh, Dan Logan? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's uh, my buddy Spud, uh, um, Danny Vice. That'd oh, be his yeah. dad. And yeah. Danny Danny is a pretty tough guy. Oh. So, so like, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the apple don't fall too far from the tree there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I was saying Dan, he's like a little dump truck. Boy, when he hits them, boy, they they know they've been hit. <laughs> yeah, Danny has a thing. He says, uh, oh, I don't know. He says, uh, like, spud smash. Like, what the heck's that? I don't know. <laughs> spud smash. Yeah, just come yeah. over here and yeah. I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's just like, leave I, I remember watching, uh, when I was younger, watching Delvey and these guys all play. All the guys he's talked about, I've I've watched them play. And my I didn't play very long to even crack a senior roster, but uh, I remember watching you guys play in Rena and Schwiegen, the old Schwiegen Warriors. Yeah. I remember watching those th those games. I remember the arena would be just packed. Yeah, it would when be. When we played against uh, Syracuse or, or Newtown, mm -hmm. you know, the, the arena was just packed, and people would be there early getting chairs and stuff watching a game. Mm -hmm. I remember playing, and it's so hot in there because there's so many people and no air conditioning, and it's not like nowadays. And... You know, that's when we built the arena. We wanted to make sure we had that kind of stuff in there. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of Newtown, like, we're not going to get into, like, the uh, Grand River Warriors drama. <laughs> we'll leave, we're we're going to, because, like, there's some can and stuff there. We're not going to get into that this episode. But what is the beef, like, this, because I've heard this goes back uh, very far, that Six Nations and Newtown. There's always been kind of a beef with lacrosse. You know, Newtown, you got to give, I got to say, they had some, really good players and like I say Jeff Gill was probably one of the top players uh, that I've ever played against and you know they had they had good teams and that's where the rivalry was the two top teams and it would always be every year us in Newtown uh, a lot of times uh, Syracuse would get in there every now and again because of guys like Boss Bucktooth and you know his brother Kevin and mm -hmm. guys Barry Paulus and a lot of guys that played on that team were 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 good and it seemed like that rivalry is because that's where the talent was that's where the best teams were you know but after the game I, the game's over I remember we'd go down to the bar down the road and Judy's there and you know have a couple of milkshakes and stuff <laughs> a couple of milkshakes yeah <laughs> you know spend a lot of time and, and make make more friends you know and we got along good after the game but like the old thing is saying, war on the floor. Mm -hmm. You know, you're out there to, to win. And, and that's what we were trying to do. Like, we do have your uh, lacrosse sticks here. So I wanted to ask you about uh, your lacrosse sticks. What is, like, the process of um, making these? And, um, like, I, I have watched on YouTube. That is as close as I've gotten to the seeing the process of it. So can you kind of explain, like, uh, what you do? Well, when... Uh in the old days, I used to split them all the time. But nowadays, with the tools that we have nowadays, a lot of use a saw, like cut them on a band saw, and and uh, use that, cut them to like inch and a half in lengths. Uh, like say for a player stick, I'll go about six feet, uh, sometimes a little bit over six feet, and then you cut them down to the inch and a half or whatever dimensions you want depending on how thick you want your sticks and so so then you you put them in in a steamer and you steam them and it's kind of a rule of thumb is an hour per inch so say like one of these like this here that's a inch and a half so you put it in there for an hour and a half most likely two hours to soften up you don't want to leave it in there too long it gets too rubbery it takes a lot longer to dry out and stuff but once you bend it uh, we put it in and have a jig and uh, pin it on a plate and then you pin it and then you put the wires on there to hold it in place this here will be down about here so you have a, a wire on there and you, you'll leave it and let it dry for a few weeks or whatever however long it takes to where that wire will loosen up once the wires 
kind of loose enough that you can take it, it's going to stay in place. Then that's when uh, the after you got all your bends done, then you start to do all the finishing, taking off the corners and stuff. And and like I say, with the tools, I know the tools that we have nowadays, they used to use the knives all the time. A lot of guys did. The Elfie, I think, mm -hmm. always used the knives and stuff. But now, like with the tools that I have, I know if Mel Squires or, or uh, Willie Logan <laughs> had the tools that I got now, I'm pretty sure they'd use them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it makes it a lot easier, quicker uh, to to do the finishing part. Same with the drills, you know. And before they used to use all leather. A lot of a lot of guys have switched to the nylon. I know if, personally for myself, I get requests for some that are all leather. They want them all leather, and I'll make them all leather. Uh, same another thing is with the cat gut. See this cat gut here, that's 10 years from now, that'll be just that straight. Remember the old days where they used to curl over with the, uh, the cat gut before, and you'd have to put popsicle sticks in there and try to keep it straight and stuff like that. But with this nylon and fiberglass uh, resin, that, that uh, cat gut will stay just as straight as it is right now. Uh, you don't have to worry about the dampness, rotting it out. Uh, you know, there's evolution like of, of lacrosse, how the sticks were in the old days, the smaller sticks, and then they went to bigger sticks, and then some of them were like almost like goalie sticks. Now they've gone to plastic sticks, but there, there's always something to make it hopefully better. Uh, for me, using the tools that I use makes it easier for me. Uh, it's quicker. Um, I, I know people call me all the time. I'm shipping sticks out to out to BC. I shipped, uh, I think, about 106 out to BC uh, back up up until May, and then I just shipped one again the other day to another person. I got a guy from Pennsylvania. I got to send three down there, and I ship them all over the place. Uh, Hamilton, New York. They're uh, their school, when the guys go over age on their lacrosse team, the field lacrosse team, he uh, gives them all a stick, and I would burn Hamilton lacrosse on there and their number. So that's a, to be able to make them quicker and, and make them more available to more people, the better off, you know, it is keeping the wooden sticks in there. I know a lot of people complain about wooden sticks in lacrosse, They've tried to ban them, I don't know how many times and how many years, you know, but we're still making them. A lot of people say, oh, only the native people can get them. That's not true. Mm -mm. Nowhere near the truth. If they want a stick, they can go down to the ILA. They can get a hold of me, get a hold of uh, the Mitchell brothers. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many stick makers out there, and you, you go on the traditional lacrosse, you'll see a bunch of guys on there. So, you know, if they want wooden sticks... They're available. Yeah, for sure. It's like, uh, it's one of those like um, hidden things, I feel like, um, not hidden things, but like, you know, as like, a, let's say a, a non-native might be like, oh, I don't know if I'm allowed to own one or something like that. Oh. Like, I feel like that would be kind of like, uh, or like, oh, I would really like to get one, but like, I don't know if it's okay to ask someone where to get one or if it's appropriate. You know, I, I think about the, the stigma that people put on us and that being one of them that am I allowed to use it of course like back before the plastic sticks there was non-native teams and they all mm. use wooden sticks that's all that was available yeah because there was no plastic stick then so for somebody to ask now am I allowed you know somewhere somewhere along the line somebody has taught them wrong They've mm -hmm. taught them something that they don't need to know or don't need to think about. Well, that's what I mentioned earlier. Um, you see a lot of players who have a wooden stick bring, bring it out in the third period because they're only intending to injure. And, and I said, those players don't know how to use it. Yeah. I, I explained to Koichi how a lot of our, our, our babies, our sons, are generally given a stick in, the, in, in their first crib yeah. or in the hospital even. Yeah. And to us, it's... 
it's like our right or left arm. It's I, my first stick was a, was a Squire stick made by made by Mel, mm. and it had its own bed. Oh, right. <laughs> I, I made a bed for my stick. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I you know I think about back. I think it was the President's Cup. Jeremy Thompson was playing for. I'm thinking it was Aquasesne, and they won the President's Cup. And Jeremy used a wooden stick the whole tournament, and he mm. won the scoring championship. And he used a wooden stick the whole, and he didn't break anybody's fingers. And mm. <laughs> you mm. know, if you know how to use it, you know they're awesome. You know, I never, when uh, they started that pro league and, and they had that team in Brantford, Ont Ontario team, mm -hmm. they were called. Mm -hmm. That's when Jim Veltman was just coming into the league. And uh, there was, uh, you know, Daryl Squires, George Atkins, myself, a um, bunch of us from home here uh, going up there to play. We got drafted by them. So then we go out to practice. And they told me that I had to use a plastic stick. I said, I never used a plastic stick in my life. My Uncle Ross called them Tupperware sticks. <laughs> Tupperware. Yeah. Disrespect. <laughs> and uh, I, I said, I can't. You, I'm not going to use one of those. And they said, well, I have to. I said, well, why? They said, for TV. I said, what do you mean for TV? He said, they want them to be able to slash and make it look more, and he said, barbaric for TV. Because if you slash the way they do now, with these sticks here, the guys will be getting their fingers broke, their wrists broke, and stuff like that. So that's I said, now I said, that, that's all right, you can go ahead and do whatever you, you want, but I'm not going to use a plastic stick. I said, time for me to retire anyway. I said, I'll just go and coach my boys. So mm -hmm. it's their turn now, so I... Never went back, and and here, uh, the first game, they are still advertising that we were playing. And so the first game, there was like 1,500 people went up there from home here to go and watch. So then none of us were playing, and here the next week, they had 200. <laughs> uh, yeah. I didn't see either, but they wanted us all to use plastic sticks, and I wasn't going to use a plastic stick. I remember the first player I ever seen use a plastic stick was Ron Henry, Mouse. Mouser, yeah. Yeah, and he was playing for Niagara, and we stepped on that stick. We clubbed it, everything, trying to break it. We finally broke it. And here we went and popped another hit on there, and away he went again. <laughs> it was good to go, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's when they first came out. He was the first one I ever seen use a plastic stick. I always never understood why people would have a like a wooden shaft but a plastic uh, head on a stick. It's just like I don't know. To me, I never understood it. Like I get it, I get, but like I get it, but they're probably using it for the wrong reason. I would feel like like um, they're, they're purposely using it to hurt someone. I remember when the, those plastic sticks start becoming really big. I, I played on on a minor team in Brantford, and we were sponsored by STX, probably STX Generation One, and um had the plastic stick and a, an aluminum shaft but it was so flimsy guys were bending them taking shots you're winding up and taking a shot and your shaft's bending and not like like a pro bend like you'd see today on, a, on an aluminum or carbon fiber shaft like bending and kinking like a broomstick or, or, or a, a broom handle you know the, the yeah. cheap brooms you get sweeping or whatever and they just bend and they kink those that's what those shafts were doing so a lot of those sticks came with wooden shafts on them already. I remember a, a guy, uh, Lindy Pempleton, yep. he had a hockey stick for a shaft. <laughs> and then they ended up outlying those like that you weren't able, because it had the square corners on mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. they end up outlawing those. But he was the first one i ever seen using a hockey stick for a shaft. <laughs> Was this before or after the Happy Gilmore movie? Because I feel like he could have been inspired by that. <laughs> oh, that was way before. Oh, Happy way before. Gilmore, yeah. Yeah. Way yeah. before oh, Happy. Yeah, would, oh, Jesus, that would be back in the 80s. Early. Yeah, early 80s. Because I think the pl first plastic head come out in like, what, 70-something. 70, 70 I don't know. The first one I seen come out was one mouse head. <laughs> <laughs> 
And then I start seeing more and more after that, and I was kind of surprised. And then next thing you know, away they went. But then when guys knew that they had to use those if they wanted to play in the pros, then everybody kind of adapted to it, I guess, mm -hmm. so, so that they were able to go on. Now, I have a question for you. Like, a, like a, we've been talking about this, I think, the last couple of uh, episodes of the podcast, but, like, we need a bigger arena. <laughs> what, what can, what can we do about that? Is, 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 <laughs> is just, it possible? He just rubs his head. Yeah. Don't, don't is, is, it, is it? I don't know. No, it, it has come up, though. We've, we've said a few times, we don't need a bigger one. We need another one already. When we were on, I was on council, and I was the chairman for recreation, and this was going back in 2000. We had a master plan, and the master plan, on that original master plan, we had a 3,000 seating capacity arena on there, and this was just before the Rama money was coming down. Now, this master plan that we had had uh, the 3,000 seating arena. We were keeping that one, and then that was going to be a second arena to it. We had the swimming pool. We had the elders room we had the youth room we had a, a gymnasium and a, a community hall and all that was on the master plan when it come down to uh, voting to okay the money for it it was tied five five and the chief had to make the final decision and he turned it down and we had the money to build that to do that and we put a lot of work into that to get that other arena, and and here it ended up getting turned down. I was I couldn't even sleep that night. It was like 4:30 in the morning. The reason he gave me was that's too much money to give to one committee, and I had such a hard time with that. I, we could have had, and it was a beautiful community hall and gymnasium and stuff, and a lot better than what we have yeah. here, a lot bigger. Plus, we had the swimming pool in there. Yeah, there was a lot of things. We had the walking track inside mm -hmm. where the gymnasium was here and the dressing rooms were underneath. Up top was the, the seating mm -hmm. to watch the games, and around that was the walking track, and that's in, that was in the master plan originally. So we would have had two arenas at that time, and that, that's what I say. That didn't stop me. That's... When I got the okay from my wife to go with the other arena, <laughs> we needed another one, but we need it for hockey too. Well, we the, need another hockey arena. The the monster that's been created, and I and I say that in a very very good way, is we have so many kids wanting to play lacrosse now. Yeah. Um, we're upwards of twenty something teams in minor alone, and now we have four junior teams, four senior teams, not including two masters teams. So there's there's actually six mas our senior teams, and senior women's. So yeah. by having that that uh, the ILA built, it's generated so many lacrosse players in our community that now there's a there's another surface that needs to be put up somewhere. Yeah. And just think, like um, you said, like how, like how many years ago was this? Because now they're trying to build like, um, like a pool. I'm pretty sure, like, uh, you know, um, Six Nations trying to build a pool. But we could have had that how many years ago? You know? Yeah, that was 24 years ago. Yeah, like 24 years ago, there. we could have just think of what it could have been, what it could have been done, and it could have been there. Yeah. See, Coach, you could have came here and learned lacrosse, learned to better yourself at lacrosse, and joined our swim team. <laughs> swim team? Yeah, swim. Well, we, don't, we don't have a swim team unless you want to swim in the river. Uh, you swim like a rock. Yeah. <laughs> you swim like a rock. Swim like a rock. <laughs> so uh, what else is going on at the ILA? I know that you have to get going soon, so um, I just want to get like a little bit of updates. Is there anything uh, new going on? Of course, we know, like right now, um, I'm, I'm, you're probably late for the game. I don't know. But the Arrows are, are playing right now. Do you have uh, any... Uh, any insight of like how do you think the playoffs are going to go for arrows? River Rivermen are actually playing at the ILA now. Friday night, oh, I, game I, one. I just hope and that we get better refing. I think everybody's seen on Facebook the the way we got shafted out in Peterborough, uh, the calls that were made, and they pretty much handed it to them, and that's. 
pretty much what we used to call the old boys club out there. Yeah. So hopefully there's going to be eyes on the game tonight as far as officiating goes. Um, if if we can get a fair shake, we can beat anybody. Well, they always say, don't leave it up to chance, right? Yeah, and that's when we coach the air, we told our guys, you know, guys, we got to be twice as good as the other teams. We can't be t close because if it's close, what's going to happen is the referees are going to step in and they're going to take over and they're going to hand it to the other teams. I've seen it so many times. I've been through it so many times. The world's out in Halifax when Iroquois Nationals were playing Team Canada and we were beating them and there was a little skirmish around in front of the net there with four minutes left. And here they were just pushing and shoving, no fights. The referees gave us two penalties and Team Canada got nothing. Now, we had two penalties. They scored shorthand, five on three, and tied it up. Then they scored again, because five on four, and they went ahead. Our guys didn't give up. They came back, and we scored 55 seconds left and tied it up. And then, and then we went, in, went into overtime. I had some of the referees, some of the head referees in Ontario, come up to me after and he said there's no way they should have made a call like that in a game like that if anything they should have took them both but to watch it you know pushing and shoving it should have been just you know the other team's ball or whatever but again the old boys club you know that's how it works and we weren't far enough ahead but we were close enough that the referees could take over and change the game yeah, I remember always hearing that, like, growing up. It's like, uh, well, you got to play the refs, too, tonight. Like, oh, yeah. Because, you know, they're they're not playing with you. They're playing against you. Yeah, it's it's hard, you know. And I remember a, a fellow, Greg Hill, when I was coaching, he said, he said, tell me, I was wondering why you're always getting mad and getting kicked out. He says, I couldn't, couldn't really see it because they were minors. And uh, he said, you know, then I, then I coach my son's team, Keegan, coached their team. And he said, the first game, he says, I got thrown out in the third period. Second game, I got thrown out in the second period. He said, it's hard to sit back and watch how the refs and the other teams get away with so much stuff, and you're supposed to sit back and take it. And that's a lot of time why I got thrown out so many mm -hmm. times, because I, you, you get tired of it. And to sit back and take it, yeah, it's hard for me to do. Especially in the minor system, because, like, uh, as parents, like, you're probably sitting there like, well, hey, like, you're teaching my kid that this is okay, that this is this is right to be treated unfairly, and we can't do anything about it. Yeah. And that's, like, it's, a, it's it's such a society thing. Like, it's that, like you said, that boys club. Yeah. I remember uh, we played in Brantford um, because of the arena down here. Uh, we played, moved the Junior Braves, we were called back mm -hmm. then, to Brantford so we had some guys from Brantford good players and stuff and one of the guys we were playing against uh, I think it was Brampton and uh, one of the guys on our team that were non-native he come up to me and he says what's a wahoo I said what he said that guy called me a wahoo what is that <laughs> I know all, what that is but we <laughs> all start laughing because like we've been getting called names and stuff like that our whole lives and for us it were we were used to it I remember uh Bob Heinbuck his boy Larry was playing on our team and some of the stuff that Larry was getting called like wagon burner and stuff like that and boy Bob he he wasn't one to just put up with stuff like that and he he was up in the stand just <laughs> He was the one ready to fight the most, <laughs> and you know because we were used to. It's it's hard to say or sad to say that we were used to it, but that's what we had to play through. Yeah, you know that kind of racism and stuff. It, we've um, over the years, I've had a lot of similar, a lot of non-native players come to Six Nations because they wanted to get better. They came here, they've joined our team, made our teams, and their parents would come up and go. I can't get over how that you guys have put up with this for so long. I'm like, well, and I even said to a couple of the parents, I remember playing against you guys 
not that long ago and you guys were the very same yeah. saying these same things and now you're on this side of the coin you see what we put up with yeah. and it and don't get me wrong Del, it, it's 2024 and we still get called wagon burners oh yeah yeah it's sad sad but you know it's it made us stronger made us work harder made us better you know to have to play through the game plus the extra stuff that they're throwing at us mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. but you learn to you know let her roll off your back and keep going yeah and like it's the creator's game it's like it's medicine right yeah. it's it's uh you know you got to take you you got to take a uh, what what can how can I word it? But like um, you know, you gotta take the yin and the yang, the good and the bad. This brings so much like greatness to our lives, but at the same time that uh, you know, sometimes when you put yourself out there, um, like even for example, like um let's say that like someone wanted to play lacrosse and they're like, Oh yeah, I wanna come to Six Nations and then they're like, Oh, well we don't want you to play on Six Nations and that's like kind of like a thing. But really it's the creator's game, it's medicine. It's for everyone. Yeah. Like that is literally like what lacrosse is for it's to get out there put your best foot forward make your life better and like uh that's to me that's what lacrosse well it's it's like a way of life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know i can honestly say we've never any teams that i've ever played on turned somebody away because of their race mm -hmm. you know i've played with a lot of guys that non-native guys over the years you know they're teammates and that's Pretty much where it stayed. Uh, I remember a fellow, uh, one of our best players in junior, uh, when we played in Brantford, Robbie Jones, and and he was black, but that guy was an awesome lacrosse player. He was an awesome basketball player. He he refs hockey and stuff now, but you know he he was just like one of us, one of one of the guys. Mm -hmm. You know we treated him like a brother. He treated us like a brother. Yeah, and he was a good lacrosse player, so he learned a lot playing with us. Uh, toughened him up a bit, <laughs> you know. And you know, he, whenever somebody was calling him names, you know, our fans, our players, stuck up for him like as if he was one of us. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Well, I wanna I wanna let you go because I do know you have a lacrosse game to get to. But I wanna thank you for coming on the show and for everyone who is um, listening right now, uh, you can place a bid. Go to www.beyondpride.com. We are gonna have an online auction for lacrosse stick to help uh, raise some funds to keep this show going because uh, this is all just done out of community, out of the love for the just the love for the game, for the creators' game. Me and Jay get together every week. Uh, we try to get together every week and just talk lacrosse, and hopefully the community can be like, hey, yeah, like we like what you do. We don't like what you do. You can come on here and you can tell us like all this. This is, this is for the community. This is actually like what it's for. It's because, again, we talk about other things than just like lacrosse, like the history of Six Nations in general. Like, I feel like this is something good that uh, the community needs, so we're trying to raise some funds. So I want to thank you for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Many hours. Oh. The Creators Game Podcast.